we have Dr. John Hethold. I am so honored. For those who don't know, Dr. John is medical doctor, juris doctor, pilot, and author, entrepreneur. Somebody said in the comment, the man who did it all. And it is so true. MD, JD, MBA, FACP. And for those who don't know, this is the Fellowship for Emergency Physicians. How did you do all of this, Doc? What is the motivation behind all of this? So it's actually not all that exciting. I mean, I, I have a low boredom threshold and I like to learn, generally speaking, because I don't know all that much. So I feel like I better go back to school to keep learning a lot more. And, you know, I always think of Pablo Picasso basically mm -hmm. in his studio until he was 98 or Da Vinci or saying, you know, in Cairo and Pyro, I'm still learning it than when he was in his 80s. So I'm like, okay, I've got a lot of learning to do because I'm yeah. not all that bright. <laughs> so when I was telling my friends that, oh, my next guest, he's done all of this, they were like, so what is behind it? Does he get bored easily? Does he just love to learn or he just wants to achieve everything in, in this lifetime? Is it just pure learning, Doc? <laughs> you know, there's that Hunter Thompson quote about life's not to arrive at a grave in a well-preserved body, but to slide in sideways yelling, holy shit, what a ride. And a <laughs> long time ago, I was taking care of this patient who was literally on his deathbed. And I remember looking at him and we had, were talking and he had this thousand yard stare and I looked at him I said he's going over everything that he didn't do but wished he had and mm -hmm. I remember thinking at the time and I was probably mid late 20s thinking I do not want to be that person I literally want to be on my deathbed going holy crap what a great ride yeah. and so I've always tried to think of that and not waste the moment that I haven't been all that great at it. I've wasted a lot of moments but I've tried <laughs> not to for each of those achievements, what were the motivations? Like, was someone in your family a physician or a pilot or a lawyer that you had to take each one? No, they're always pragmatic. Learning to fly, I was afraid of flying. And I kind of mm -hmm. grew up in a household where like, oh, you don't want to be in a small plane. And it looked mm -hmm. so much fun to me. And I've always loved aircraft. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to be able to use aircraft for my businesses. So I fly to different hospitals in the helicopter or in the planes. In law school was pragmatic. It thought at some point, I probably won't be able to be in an emergency department when I'm, you know, 75 years old. So I thought I'll go to law school to defend physicians mm -hmm. who have contract issues or medical board complaints. Mm -hmm. And the MBA was really, I don't know much about business. And I started mm -hmm. a couple. So I, okay, I better learn something. Otherwise, I'm just guessing. And like Six Sigma Black Belt was pragmatic. I liked doing process improvement, but didn't have the theoretical or mathematical ability or knowledge to be able to put my thoughts into mm -hmm. some, some sort of mathematical formula. So th there's always some pragmatism behind it but generally speaking i just really like to learn and was it specifically towards the sciences that you were initially interested in as a kid that you chose medicine as your route well since i was a little kid i mean i can think i remember five or six years old thinking i wanted to be a physician i mean really mm -hmm. small I, I don't know why none of my family my sister's mm -hmm. an emergency medicine physician but she was behind me mm -hmm. but i didn't really have a role model growing up as a physician i just knew that i wanted to be one and when i look back at my personal statement for medical school or things i wrote in college, it's the exact same way I think today. Like I could have written them today and they've come out exactly the same. So I, I really do think I was born to practice medicine and take care of people. But I like doing these other things as well. And I didn't want to sacrifice them to yeah. take care of people. So I tried to do both. Yeah. I watched your interview TED Talks with ASU and you said that you weren't really the top student in school. No. You showed your grades with the Fs. And do you think that's an integral part of becoming a physician or any career? How important do you think are grades? in showing the qualities of a person and how can they be successful in a specific field? So, I mean, Christian, it's a great question. And, you know, I always laugh. I mentor a lot of medical students now mm -hmm. or pre-med students who are in medical school. And I always say I could not compete with them. I mean, they are so <laughs> far beyond anywhere I ever was at their age. But grades are kind of the ticket to the ride. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for law school or for medical school, you have to have a certain GPA. You have to have certain scores on your MCAT. Mm -hmm. And frankly, when I was in high school, I had horrible study habits. And I was mm -hmm. a jock and not a very good one at that. And I got okay grades. I got C's. And, but I always had this thing in my head and I'd always say to people, when it matters, when it counts, I'll make it worthwhile. I'll, I'll do what I need to do when it counts. Part of it, I think, was just a defense mechanism for getting poor grades. And mm. Part of it, I think I actually really believed, which was probably more crap, old BS than anything else. But then in college, all of a sudden, got my legs under me and said, gosh, I think I can actually do this. And then that bit of confidence I got just compounded and I kind of never looked back. And so I studied hard 
hard and I had to, mm-hmm. but it was like with this end in sight of which for me was, you know, I didn't have a B or C plan. It was just, I'm going to medical school. You know, I'd cut off my arm to go to medical school. <laughs> and how was medical school for you? Did it come easy? Did it come too hard for you? What do you think was the biggest thing that you learned in medical school aside all of the medical concepts? I think the biggest thing that I learned was, you know, give me, I'll give you an example. So in college, I took physiology and it was mm-hmm. hard and I got an A in it and mm-hmm. learned a lot. And I remember thinking going to the medical school physiology, like, oh, okay, I've got physiology down. I mean, I got an A in it. We learned in medical school what I learned in college in about the first two and a half to three weeks. And one thing in medical school is you literally drink from a fire hose. And you initially think there is no way I'll be able to keep up because it's just so much material. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you do it and it makes sense. So medical school was difficult. I studied a lot. It was a lot harder for me than law school was, but I would do it again because I had a blast. I mean, I had a great time in medical school, but it was definitely, you know, 70 hour a week sort of job. Being far done from medical school for decades on and going through your life being a physician and given how arduous and long and stressful the road to medicine is, do you have any regrets entering medicine? I have zero regrets. I would do it again in a heartbeat. And in fact, I tell, you know, I have friends or, and colleagues. In fact, I've got a medical school reunion Zoom call in about an hour and 15 minutes. And so I finished medical school in 86. So you can do the math, but it wasn't yesterday. It was 35 years <laughs> ago. And I tell everybody I would do it again in a heartbeat. I mean, I was born to do this. I can't remember the percentage of physicians that say they do it again, but it's relatively small. It's under, well under 50%. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if some of those physicians just, they kind of picked the wrong specialty. Mm-hmm. They picked the wrong career or life happens and they just were beaten down by the system. Mm-hmm. And the system is kind of a beat down system in some respects. So for me, having these other alternative lives of law and business mm-hmm. and flying, for me, it was never, it was never a hard stop. I love practicing medicine. I was in the emergency department yesterday and loved it. And I always look forward to going back. Then again, I'm only doing it eight or 10 times a month now. You said also during your talk with Ted that being in emergency medicine, it doesn't feel like you worked a single day in your life becoming an emergency physician doctor. Can you expand more on that? How did you choose emergency medicine as your specialty? So it's kind of funny. So I had worked as an orderly in the emergency department for a couple of years, Mm -hmm. cleaning bedpans, pushing patients around, doing CPR, and really enjoyed it. But since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. Mm -hmm. I had books by DeBakey and Cooley and and just was, I mean, that was it for me until I followed or shadowed or was a medical student with these two CT surgeons in medical school who were malignant is the best way to say it. I mean, they were instrument throwing, swearing, cussing in the OR, just malignant people. And I remember thinking, I do not want to be them. And I thought in my naivete, they could not have gotten into medical school if they were this bad. Therefore, it must have been their training that made them this bad. I don't want to end up like that. I'm not going to do that. So I picked something else. And emergency medicine was kind of always in the back of my mind. And it really fits my personality more. But that's how I got into it. But, you know, for the majority of my life, I want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon and be like Michael DeBakey and Denton Cooley. Wow, that's amazing. Speaking of emergency medicine, I work in cardiothoracic surgery, actually, in the step down. So oh, I, know. I know what you're talking about. And the emergency room, even during nursing school, I was like, oh, I will never do trauma. I will never do emergency. Everything happens there. Everything happens. Everything doesn't happen. And a lot of the questions that were submitted, what were the wildest memories that you have had as an emergency physician, whether it's the scariest, the wildest, the funniest, or whatnot? As you can imagine, you know, after this many years, I have (laughs) crazy stories of the emergency (laughs) department. And I've almost become immune to them because Mm -hmm. there's so many of them that you just literally cannot believe. And so some of the wilder ones were, of course, foreign bodies in areas where they shouldn't be pulling, you know, large things out of people's rear ends and other orifices that you're just kind of shrugging. And you say, well, how did that get in there? And they kind of look at you innocently and go, well, it was the weirdest thing. I was in the shower and I slipped. And you're like, okay. But, you know, one of the more amazing stories I had, this was when I was a a resident, was there was a woman sitting on a guardrail in Chicago. Her car broken down. Her and her mom were driving. 
and she was sitting on a guardrail and she in fact she was straddling a guardrail and she was a larger woman she probably weighed 250 pounds and a semi truck hit the tow truck that was trying to jack up her car to tow it away and somehow her car hit her and she went sliding down the guardrail now i, I nicknamed her the human monorail because that's kind of what it was like and she degloved all her skin from her mid chest down through her groin, up to her mid back and down both legs. So she came in and she was a wreck. I mean, her skin was literally like, uh, if you think of a glove turned inside out, pulled off your arm, that's what her legs were like. Unbeknownst to her, she was carrying a full-term fetus. So we delivered this full-term fetus and the baby mm -hmm. did fine. The poor guy, the tow truck driver got killed. Both his legs were crushed and he died of blunt trauma. And she went sliding down this guardrail and she lived. Baby lived, baby did fine. She had a lot of skin grafts and she did fine. She'd always bring a spot Kolachkis, which are this Polish cookie, mm -hmm. on the day on the anniversary of her getting shot down the guardrail. So that was one of my more wild stories, but just had tremendous amount of kind of crazy, funny things. There was a guy that I took care of who came in with, multiple trauma and his nose was all white so i'm trying to put it together i'm like and he was awake and i said so what happened to you i couldn't feel out west got a white nose and he just beat the hell he said well i was standing on this bridge embankment puffing paint where you spray paint into a bag it was white paint i got high i fell off the embankment like 15 feet and then i got run over by a truck and the funny part about this was other than being kind of banged up and scraped up and having a white nose he was basically unscathed i don't even think he broke a bone now yeah. who gets hit by a truck while 15 feet and is just scraped up and then you have some people who do the smallest minorest things and they wind yeah. up dead it's like there's no rhyme or reason to it oh my gosh actually what's really funny is because emergency physicians are known for pulling out the most bizarre objects out of people's orifices can you name three of the weirdest things that you pulled out of a person's body? Sure, yeah. So I nicknamed myself Lord of the Cock Ring because for some reasons I always was the one cutting off these solid steel chrome <laughs> rings that men put around their penises. Now, intuitively, you think they'd have a clasp on them, but in, these, in their excitement, they would just stuff themselves through these things. And then once they were erect and swollen, they couldn't get them off, no pun intended. So I was Lord of the Cock Ring for a while. But I pulled out golf balls, dildos, of course, crack cocaine, you know, drugs and bags. Uh, I had a friend pull out a shiny motivational stone. I'm trying to think what else. I had a lady came in the other day who thought she had a puppy in her vagina. And I, I looked and nothing bit me, so I thought I was fine. But uh, she was puppy free. Um, <laughs> I did, I did call PETA on her, of course, but that's another story. Wow. And how do you react to those moments? How do you maintain professionalism during those bizarre moments? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to keep in a straight face because I can literally almost talk to anybody and be warm and humorous and keep a straight face despite the craziness that they're telling me. I don't know how, because many times, so I'll give you an example. There was a guy who came in with a swastika tattoo on his penis, and he was a skinhead. He was just had hate tattoos all over him. So I said, oh my God, sir, I said, you've made my day. I, I said, you've totally made my day. I said, I've never seen anybody with a swastika tattooed on their penis. I said, thank God you're so under-endowed, because that would have really hurt. And I don't think he knew what the word under-endowed meant. So he just said, oh yeah, thanks. And the poor <laughs> scribe I was with just put her head down and walked out of the room laughing but i've been pretty good at keeping a straight face over the years wow i can't imagine for some people emergency medicine is more of like trauma scary gory stuff but there's actually instances like that where you'll probably just crack out the whole time so what piece of motivation would you want to give to a medical student who wants to go into emergency medicine so i would tell them this i said it is a phenomenal job i absolutely love it because you are impacting people during what's often is the worst day of their life to that point, whether you're telling them that their seizure was caused by a brain tumor that they didn't know they had, which is not uncommon, that their skin is yellow because they have a pancreatic tumor, that they have some other fatal disease or near fatal disease. And it's your opportunity to sit down with somebody and really be kind and gentle and caring at a time when they really need it. It's the best career in the world. You can impact people at the worst day of their lives, either just by small acts of kindness. It mm -hmm. also gives the opportunity to really on top of your game in the heat of the moment and not lose your cool, whether it's mm -hmm. protecting their airway or stopping bleeding mm -hmm. or diagnosing somebody's having a heart attack or a stroke. 
Yeah. It's really great. The other thing is it allows you to do is pursue other things that you're interested in. So mm -hmm. it's very shift work. So, you know, if you're working four 12-hour shifts a week, you have three other days to do stuff. And so I've really enjoyed being able to do that those other days. Yeah, actually, there was a question of how does the usual schedule of an EM doctor look like? But back in the days, I would work up to 24, 25, 12 hour shifts a month. Most physicians work probably 12 to 16, 8, 10, or 12 hour shifts. And you usually do them in blocks. So you'll do four mm -hmm. nights in a row, a couple of days off, four days in a row, things like that. You know, two weekends a month and some night shifts a month. So it's kind of all over the map. The one thing it does affect is your sleep-wake cycle, which is difficult. Yeah. And you said you graduated medical school in 86, right? 86. 86. Yeah. For sure, medicine, science, and technology has changed so much since then. Do you like how medicine has changed over the years? I do. You know, it's improved our ability to diagnose people. You can come into the one of the emergency departments where I work with low back pain and tingling down your leg and get an MRI mm -hmm. 30 minutes. You know, way back when, getting the CAT scan of someone's brain took an hour. And mm -hmm. so it's the things we do now, the diagnosis we're able to make in the emergency department have mm -hmm. improved exponentially. I mean, we before when a trauma patient came in, you'd stick a needle in their abdomen and use a liter of saline, turn it upside down. And you literally, I remember, it's, and you'd send the fluid off and to see how red it was, how many blood cells were in it. But the old adage was, you can read newspaper through it. There's not enough blood cells in it. And if you can't, then you had to open them up and take, take them to surgery and open them up for abdominal trauma. So it's changed quite a bit. And ultrasound has changed it as well. Mm -hmm. Just the ability to diagnose at bedside with ultrasound. Yeah. And I think what also changed a lot, especially the past year in the whole, not just the medical world, but the whole world itself was the pandemic, COVID-19. How did that change yeah. your practice as an emergency room doctor? Well, it's interesting. I worked at a big level one trauma center and then mm -hmm. up on different reservations as well. Mm -hmm. And so there were times when, you know, 70 beds, 60 of them would be having someone with COVID in them who was at either moderately sick to severely ill and intubated and literally dying. And so so it was oddly kind of a wake up call to, I think, the entire world, but certainly to us in the emergency department. You know, I've worked a lot lately and probably about, you know, one patient per shift would have COVID. And before it was, you'd have 12 to 20 patients with COVID. So it's kind of a wake up call. One, on just wearing a mask and hygiene and mm. two, kind of reliving the 1918 pandemic mm. because the similarities were remarkable. Yeah. How did you decompress out of that? I can imagine just how stressful and that the term called moral injury was flying across yes. the nation of seeing patients pass here and there, not being able to save anyone, them, you know, passing alone without their families by their side. How did you go through that? How did you deal with that? Especially with news of physician suicide during this whole pandemic. How did you decompress out of that, Doc? So I had it comparatively easy compared to many of my peers who were mm -hmm. on the East Coast. In Arizona, although we got hit hard, it was nowhere near like I heard it was in New York and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. so, so I actually had it pretty easy. And although we'd have numerous patients a day be incredibly ill, and, and many die, it wasn't the horrible battle scenes that they fought mm -hmm. in, in the mm -hmm. East Coast. So just knowing that someone has it a lot worse than I had it gave me mm -hmm. zero complaint. I think the hardest thing was seeing very ill patients say goodbye to their loved ones over FaceTime. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that, that was really difficult where people couldn't get into the hospital, even if they didn't have COVID, even if their loved one didn't have COVID, they were letting, yeah. you know, we were letting no one in. So, you know, moms would give birth to babies without their significant and other around people would be their children would be in there and their parents couldn't be in that, that was really hard yeah i remember so i do work in a cardiothoracic floor but it was converted into covid icu and the pandemic hit new york and like you said doc our patients were saying goodbyes to their family members through zoom and FaceTime. Yeah. Um, and it was the most heartbreaking thing ever, especially because some of the family members were back in Texas or in California and the flights were halted during that time. And it was the most heartbreaking thing. So I agree with you there. But aside from COVID, throughout all these years of seeing such horrendous sights in a trauma center, how did you compress outside of work? Do you do something during work? Do you break 
time or right when you finish work or when not? So I, I exercise a lot, which helps me mm -hmm. decompress. I read a lot, which helps me decompress. I've actually, I started meditating, which helps. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think most emergency medicine physicians, and this isn't a compliment, have the incredible ability. Most people in medicine, but particularly emergency medicine, have this ability to departmentalize where they walk out of the emergency department mm -hmm. and they're able to snap their fingers and and put it behind them and and go on. I think a lot of people this year saw so much stuff that the finger snapping no longer worked, that they leave their mm -hmm. wrecked and they go back the next day wrecked and the next day wrecked and then they'd be sleep deprived and they'd be mm -hmm. more wrecked. You know, there's that EM physician in New York who killed herself and he was a total rock mm -hmm. star and a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. You think, wow, if a person like that, that can happen to, it can happen to any of us. Yeah. So it was tough, but like I said, I think I had a comparatively easy mm -hmm. A lot of folks so i'd have zero room to complain about it and i thank and i'm impressed by my colleagues who were able to pull through it because it was hard days still we thank you for your service doc especially in emergency medicine and still extending it to helping physicians not just with entrepreneurship but also like you said getting your law degree to help physicians can you talk more about that the impetus to like go for your jd so you know i thought there'll be a time when practicing emergency medicine is you know on you know holidays and Christmas and weekends and nights will get a little old, despite the I thought, okay, what how what else do to help? And so I've always understand the physician mindset. And you know, physicians get themselves in trouble all sorts of ways. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna go and defend them in front of the medical board. So my very first case, I had this guy call me up, it was a Wednesday, and he said, I'm going before the medical board on Friday. Can we meet? So I meet him at Starbucks, and I was out of law school probably six months. So I meet him at Starbucks, and this guy is literally Mr. Rogers. He's wearing a cardigan sweater, he's got loafers on. He was probably 65. He looked like Mr. Rogers, just a wonderful guy. So why are you going for the medical board? I mean, you're Mr. Rogers, for God's sakes. He's like, oh, I don't know. You know, I'm getting divorced. And my wife, you know, she was a patient of mine. And, you know, we started having a relationship. And, you know, obviously, you can't have sex with your patients. So I said, well, how long ago was that? He said, well, like, I don't know, 25 years ago. I said, are you sure that's what it is? Because I can't imagine a medical board, after you've been married for 24 years, <laughs> thinks this is an issue. No, I, I don't know what else it could be. All right. So, you know, I go in there with them. I'm fat, dumb, and happy. And we're sitting there and they come in and, you know, they talk to them and they, it's what they're going down their list of questions. And I'm kind of just nodding and I kind of coached him on how to respond. And I says, uh, doctor, have you ever used any drugs? And I kind of look at him like, is somebody like asking me if I use drugs? Like, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, no, he doesn't use drugs. He's Mr. Rogers, for God's sakes. And he goes, no. I said, never. And I'm thinking, uh oh. He says, no. <laughs> drugs well you know i don't know back when i was in college oh, no. ah, all right how long ago was that he goes 15 years now i'm not a math wizard but i'm pretty sure it's 65 you're in college a lot longer than 15 years ago so now i'm thinking uh oh there's something i don't know so they go okay so they go out of their room and i look at them i go anything you want to tell me now because yeah, my wife and i used to you know get stoned uh, three or four times a week i go that's why you're here and so as you can imagine it did not end well for him but the couple of cases i had and so they just smacked the crap out of him. And then I had another case where this poor guy, I don't think did anything wrong. It was from a med mail case. And it just, you know, I just defended the heck out of him and he still got smacked around. And I thought, you know, I'm going to stick to contract issues and, you know, kind of medical malpractice defense because this board stuff is tough. So that was my entree into law. And it was so evident in your new book, your proficiency in the whole law side of business. And actually, that's why also I was so excited for us to talk tonight because you want to introduce your new book, which I have here with me. Thank you for sending it, Doc. I finished it, I think, two days ago after you Thank sent you. it last week. Entrepreneur RX, which you can get from Dr. John's website. It's basically a guide for physicians to start a business, right? Can you give us a summary, Doc, of what your book is all about? Thank you. The summary, it is how to start a business one. 101. So what you'll be subjected to is every mistake I've made in 30 years of starting businesses. And there's a lot of mistakes. But the idea is, it's the book I say, I wish I could have written this for myself 30 years ago. So I wouldn't have made all the dumb mistakes I did. It starts out saying, A, you can do this. B, it is a lot of work. And C, it'll make you a better doctor mm -hmm. because it'll be an outlet for your kind of creative energies. And so for me, it's been a way to combat burnout mm -hmm. and really keep me in the game longer. But also, 
for me, I've always liked multiple sources of income. And I used to think emergency medicine was recession proof and it probably is, but it's not COVID proof. Yeah. And so I know a lot of folks who got laid off or had their hours cut back a lot in emergency medicine because of COVID and a lot of other physicians too. So I was fortunate to have a couple streams of income along the way. So I didn't have to just rely on the money I made practicing emergency medicine. So I think that's for no other reason than peace of mind. It gives yeah. you peace of mind if you can start a business and drive some income from it. Like you were saying, Doc, about telling us all of your mistakes over the past 30 years. I was so amazed with how transparent you were with the mistakes you're talking about. And one of my most favorite parts of the book was in the subtopic where you said, fail fast and fail often. I'll quote from the book. It says, it can teach you a great deal, perhaps even more than your successes. And the faster you fail, the faster you can learn and move on from there. This concept of failure seems to be such an integral part of even society now. I talk to certain friends. They don't want to pursue this or that. They don't want to do this or that because of the fear of failure. What is the one or two things that you have learned about failure, dog, after all the mistakes that you have mentioned? So most of it comes down to perspective. And it's really how you look at it. So if you approach it as, wow, I screwed that one up and, you know, I've found a new way to fail and laugh it off and get up and dust yourself off. You know, that, that old Chinese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. Mm -hmm. And it's really like that. And it's, you know, the Winston Churchill success mm -hmm. is moving from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And what I've learned is for every failure I've had, and, and I mean every failure, if I was able to keep my wits about me and keep my eyes open, there was always something better around the corner. So Next Care, this large urgent care center for me was ultimately a failure, but it allowed me to start MeMD, which was this virtual medicine platform, literally two weeks later. And so, but for me failing at Next Care, MeMD wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I can look back at all these different inflection points in my life and think mm -hmm. back and say, thank God that happened because but for that, I wouldn't be where I am today. I think for a lot of people in medicine, you know, I call them the fragile perfects. I was an RA in college and I'd have these kids show up in my dorm room and they'd be crying and they'd gain 15 pounds and started smoking and got a D in a test. And I'd be like, are you kidding me? Like, these not so bad. I had a lot of these. And they were so used to getting straight A's that they mm. totally devolved when they had any little chink in the armor. Mm. And so I think for me growing up, effing up a lot, I kind of got immune to failure because it was like, eh, that's just what happens. And so if you can take your ego out of the equation and not look at it like, I'm not going to try because I don't want to fail, as opposed to saying, look, I'm probably going to fail, but whatever it is, I'm going to have the grittiness to get up and survive and press on. I think that's what the ultimate difference is between people who are find success in entrepreneurs and those that don't or don't want to try. Wow, that is so insightful, dog, and so motivating. Speaking of successes, though, after failures, like you mentioned with MeMD, which has been acquired by Walmart this year, congratulations, dog. What Thank a great you. success. This is amazing. Congratulations. Can you Thank please you. tell us about MeMD and the world of telemedicine that is changing the world, especially during the pandemic? So I started MeMD in 2010, again, right coming right out of a 17-year failure. And it made all the sense in the world to me. I mean, we did everything else online, banking, education, school, why not healthcare? And so for me, this was a total no-brainer. Well, it took a lot of years before people really picked up on this. And the pandemic certainly helped us. And so I was laughing with our CFO today and said, you know, thank God for all the failures we had with MeMD because but for them, we wouldn't be here with Walmart now. And it was really after failures that, that the path just wound itself along and we kept just gutting it out and putting more time, effort and money into it. They were able to, you know, get the attention of Walmart. What was fortunate for us is going to change the world in healthcare mm -hmm. and needed the telemedicine platform and some expertise where we're able to come together. So it's been a huge blessing and I'm looking forward to working with Walmart because I think that they are going to change the world. And how does MeMD specifically work for those who don't know? Is it through video? Is it through text or call or all of the above for patients? It's, so it's, it's all of the above. The easy way is you can go online, go to MeMD.me or MeMD.com and, and log on and see a provider in about 10 minutes. It's pretty inexpensive. A lot of people have it through their business, through their health plan, through their employer. But you can also do it direct to consumer where you just go online and request a provider. We do behavioral health as well. Uh, so you can see a behavioral health counselor. And mm -hmm. the reason I started that initially was for behavioral health because we'd have mm -hmm. these folks in the emergency department who needed behavioral health help and there's 
was no help for them. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wouldn't it be great? There's no stigma. They can be at home and see a provider, get the treatment they need. It's all good. And behavioral health was slow to take off. And so we really kind of started with urgent care and didn't have behavioral health for, gosh, six six or seven years. That's amazing, Doc. And thank you for doing that. And congratulations again. Thanks. That is so big. And that is so exciting. We're basically going to see it all over the nation at this point. Yeah, it's, a, it's I like to become a huge Walmart fan because, boy, they are... <laughs> they are But, but all kidding aside, they have been nothing but professional and absolutely patient-centric. I, I've been so impressed with their leadership. Yeah. In the book, you also talked about choosing the right people for your businesses, right? I feel like also as a business owner, one of the biggest issues or thoughts is who are the right people who will work alongside you and fulfill your mission statement, right? That you have talked about. Like you said in your book at MeMD, our mission is to provide exceptional care every day, one patient at a time. So can you tell us about your ideal culture for your business and how do you find the right people for that? So that's a great question, Christian. So so, you know, there's that old saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've become an ardent believer in that because I've actually had, you know, the one bad apple ruin a culture. And mm -hmm. so now I'm incredibly selective of who gets on the team. But I'm looking for people who are very mission driven, who understand where the business is going and work hard to try to get there. And I really search for basically, you know, kindness, empathy, humility in mm -hmm. folks that we hire and in the ability to communicate is paramount. And I've found I've been very fortunate to find some really phenomenal people. Mm -hmm. And I certainly made some mistakes along the way in finding those people and rooting them out and, and parting ways with them mm -hmm. professionally and gently is important as well. I did learn from reading Jack Walsh's book that holding on to people who don't deserve to be there, who aren't part of the culture, is not good for either the business or for them. And so I've really tried to take that to heart. So there's no surprises, the discussions with them, you know, here's the bar, here's where you are, we need you to get up to the bar and I will help you. And if you can, great, I'm in. And if you can't, that's okay, but then we need to part ways and we'll part ways respectfully. So there's no recrimination and no hard feelings. So I'm going to support you no matter what, but here's the bar, you've got to get to it. And when you have discussions like that, you take out all the emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. For me, and people will find this out when they read the book, my most favorite part of the book is actually the end. It was such a sweet surprise and I won't give it all away, but it's your 21 rules. And the very first one is being kindness always, which is very touching when I read it. I was like, this is an amazing list, but it's very interesting how you put that as the number one rule is kindness always. In relation to hiring positions specifically for your practices and for your businesses, I think my question is, what do you think makes a good position? for all pre-med students out there or med students. I feel like there's so many motivations behind why a person would go into medicine. We've heard it all, right? Like money, status, honor, or because their parents wanted them to. But for you, Doc, what do you think makes a physician? I think the best physicians are those that put the patient's needs above their own and can treat patients no matter how difficult, and, and believe me, I'm far from perfect, but no matter how difficult or challenging the patient is, despite that, you can treat that patient with kindness and empathy. You know, I'll give you an example. There was a kid I took care of a, uh, probably a year ago or so now, and he was drunk and homeless and, you know, hadn't showered in weeks. And I sat down in the bed next to him and I said, you know, how do I have the pleasure of helping you today. And he told me this story about how his parents had thrown him out of the house when he was 18. And he basically had been struggling for 11 years. And he apologized to me for being there. And I said, are you kidding? I said, if I lived through what you lived through, I'd be far drunker than you are. So, you know, I, I'm honored to help you. And I think if you take the time to go deep with folks and find out kind of the root cause of how they are, where they are, it's not hard to have empathy for them because many of the patients I see are sometimes the most difficult patients. Their story, and I don't say many, all, their story almost always is horrible. What they've lived through, what they've survived, and God bless them, they're doing the best they can. And until, like they say in The Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. when Atticus is talking to Scout, he says, you know, you never know until you put on someone's skin and walk around it for a while. I try to really think of that and say, you know, I'm an old white guy. I had a pretty freaking easy. You know, there's a lot of folks who, not a lot, most folks who had it far harder than I have. And so this kindness always is easy because you don't know the challenges they've had in their life. So to have some empathy and kindness towards them should not be difficult. And I think if you do that as a physician, you'll go far.
Wow, that's so eye-opening. Through all of that, for sure, thousands and countless of patients that you have seen and dealt with, even through your law degree and even in aviation, if there is one thing that you could tell the viewers that we have right now and those who will watch this live again, what would that be after all that you have learned and experienced? So here, it's that's easy. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it. And I say that with great sincerity. I barely passed high school. There is nothing special about me other than that I have grit and I'm generally too dumb to quit. I have a sign in my office that says, never give up. And I try to embody that sign. And I think it just comes down, life comes down to perspective and grit. And if you can look at different perspectives and have the grit and tenacity to carry on, even when you're down and beat up and tired, mm -hmm. you can pretty much accomplish anything. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's that easy. And again, I'm, I had it easy. So mm -hmm. there's people who have it far, far harder than I do. So God bless them. But I think with grit and perspective, you can accomplish most things. Okay. Thank you. If you could please invite everyone to get your new book, Entrepreneur All Right. And honestly, reading this book, even though I am not a physician, I think it's so much insight and learn so many things from this book, even outside of medicine. Thanks. I mean, it's not just written for physicians. It was just, you know, the, the ultimately the title of the book. You know, it's easy for healthcare professionals, but it was it is kind of the 101 business book. It was mm -hmm. hopefully has some humor in it and some anecdotes, but some kind of the, the 101 sort of knowledge that you should have before you start a business. Mm -hmm. or while starting a business. It's a knowledge that I wish I had when I started. Yeah, it's a great book. Thank you so much, Doc. So what is your favorite failed business? And with that, Doc, can you please tell this funny story of, what's it, Nextcare's name? Well, so, so Nextcare's name is, is kind of boring. It was, I'd worked a reverse night, so I'd worked nights and then days. It was a reverse 24, we call them. It was about 3 p.m., and I'd worked since the day before, since the night before. I hired a firm to help me with the name. So they faxed me sheets and sheets of these names, Cornerstone Urgent Care, Brick Urgent Care. And I was like, oh God, I hope it's the next one. I'm like, next one, next one, next care. And, and that's how the name stuck. Now, before next care was called Arizona Family and Urgent Care. Until I heard someone answer the phone, thank you for calling off luck. And I thought, you know, that's probably not going to be the name that I'm going to be able to keep. And so that was that. But the favorite failed business story is I owned hot dog stands. They were actually kind of successful, but, you know, they only were successful for about two hours a day. And one night I had gone to school. I was getting my MBA and I'd gone to school all day Friday. I'd worked the night shift all that Friday night. And the next morning, the gal was supposed to be manning the hot dog stand at Home Depot calls me and says, hey, I'm not feeling well. You know, I'm not going to take the hot dog stand in the Home Depot. I'm like, well, God, it's a Saturday. It's our biggest day. But I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I go hit the hot dog stand up to my car. I drive it to Home Depot. I load it. It's about noon and I'm leery eyed, tired. And I'm wearing my big dog's apron and I see this guy kind of <laughs> staring at me. And I, every time I looked up, he was staring at me. And so, you know, I did what all kids who grew up, all men who grew up Catholic do is they think, oh my God, my zipper's down. I'm like, well, no, it's not good. So finally he comes over and he goes, uh, don't I know you from someplace? And I go, I don't think so. He goes, no, no, I do. He said, you stitched my foot up last week at Tempe St. Luke's. And I go, Ugh. I said, okay. And he goes, and you left some glass in it. And I go, and that's why I'm cooking hot dogs here today. <laughs> And with, and with that, the next week, the hot dog stands were gone. Wow. Dr. John is not just a medical doctor, not just a Jewish doctor, a pilot, but also a hot dog standee. Hot dog. Really the man who did it all. Big dogs. Big dogs. That's amazing. Wow. I can just imagine. What I'm very curious, Doc, is do you remember everything that you've went through so far? Like, did they just pop in your head, like, when you're laying down in bed at night? It's like, oh, I remember this one time. I remember this one time. I've had so many stupid stories that, that I perpetrated that, yeah, they'll pop in my head and be like, oh, God, yeah, that's <laughs> one. Yeah, constantly. <laughs> They've all been overpowered with everything you have accomplished, Doc. Dr. John, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I have learned so much, and I'm sure thank you for sure. to learn so much, too. And congratulations on your new book, and <laughs> congratulations thank on you. EMD being acquired by Walmart. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. You are such a motivation to me specifically. I await all of your posts, and thank you for saying yes for being with us here tonight. I was oh, so intimidated. So I, was, I was so nervous. I was texting my mom earlier, and I was like, I am freaking scared to go into the live stream tonight it is such an honor so christian thank you you're, you're doing great work thanks for bringing all these phenomenal people uh, of which i'm not one but thank you for bringing these okay. people to light and keep up the great job um my closing message again is the same thing if i can do it anybody can so head down ready to rock